Uh, this is a, a diagram showing you how uh, these cells were originally discovered through the painstaking work of David Hubel and Thorsten Weasel. They received a Nobel Prize for their efforts, uh, really understanding the first level of uh, encoding in the visual system and this idea that particular neurons have a uh, maximum preference or maximum firing rate for a particular angle of these oriented edges and that the response falls off as a function of kind of uh, discrepancy from that preferred orientation. And this gives rise to this notion of a tuning curve. This is what we talked about in the case of distributed representations in general, that, that each neuron has some kind of overall graded encoding and that gradedness makes it able to cover a much larger space much more efficiently by encoding relative strengths of different uh, uh, such tuned detectors. Another phenomenon that we can see in V1 is this really interesting uh, pattern of topography. And so this diagram here is showing you the different orientations. So here there is the kind of code. This rotation around this kind of pinwheel of orientations is characteristic of certain subregions of overall V1 coding. Uh, and you can see that there's these, these kind of bands or regions of, uh, of orientation pinwheels emerging in different areas of V1. And so part of what we're going to look at in our first model is how uh, lateral connectivity in the cortex is able to support this kind of neighborhood topographic encoding of uh, orientation information. So in our first model, we're going to look at how the visual system encodes uh, real-world natural stimuli images. These are pictures from my trip to New Zealand, and uh, you can see they're quite different from each other. You wouldn't really know exactly what's in common between them because they're supposed to be quite different. But in fact, there is something common across each of these different images, and that is, in fact, these oriented edges are present in every one of these images. And what we did to, to see this is just presented small patches of these images to our pure Hebbian learning system and allowed that system to use this kind of BCM Hebbian self-organizing learning principles that we looked at in chapter four. And lo and behold, it extracts these oriented edge detectors. And this is a picture of that same kind of pinwheel structure that we just looked at with this topography that emerges in this model. Uh, each individual square here shows the receptive field plot of an individual neuron. So very similar to what we're seeing here, the kind of oriented edge coding of a particular neuron, uh, active, activated when, the, when it's lighter here and darker there. Um, and you can see those orientations kind of move around the central pinwheel point, uh, just like you see in those topography figures. Okay, here's the model that uh, we're going to use. Uh, we also looked at this actually earlier in the self-organizing section, but now we're going to go into it in a little more detail, looking at how uh, these individual visual inputs activate uh, in the on versus off center. So now we have a little bit more background to understand that this left input is a on-center uh, set of filters that are applied to a particular su subsection of those images. And then this is the off-center. And what you'll notice is that they're complementary. So anywhere that you have activity in the on-center portion, it's not active in the off-center and vice versa. And so that really tells you that this is uh, a region where the image is darker than it is lighter, and this is a region here where the image is lighter than it is darker. And as you can see very clearly in this particular input, uh, edges really have, you know, are present as correlational structures in these images. And that means specifically that if you're going to have some activity at some point along a kind of oriented edge, you expect to see further activity along that same vector, that same line angle, um, as you go along. And again, it's not perfect. Sometimes it's splotchy. But as we look at different images, we, we continue to see 
evidence that there are these kind of edge-like features. These, these lines persist for at least some amount of distance uh, along these edges, these angles. There's a great example there. Uh, again, these are not any contrived examples. They're just random pictures that we're looking at. We can actually look at the picture in the model that it's that it's currently looking at. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see because it's just a small zoomed in section. Um, but when we look at this, you get uh, this kind of you know whirlwind flash of different images, and across all of those images, the network is seeing all these different inputs. Uh, for all these different angled lines and at each point when we present one of these inputs it's activating through the normal random initial synap synaptic weights a set of neurons here in V1 uh, those are competing with each other according to the inhibitory competition mechanisms the feed forward feedback inhibition um, and that produces a specific pattern of activity and one thing that we have here that we didn't have in chapter four is lateral connections. And so now if I look at this connectivity, you can see that it receives from its neighbors in a kind of falling off Gaussian kind of tuning curve. And so everywhere we go, each neuron kind of receives from its own local neighborhood and it receives most strongly from the immediate neighbors and then it falls off from there. And that excitatory connecti connectivity then means that if one of my neighbors gets activated, I'm more likely to be active as a neuron here next to it because I'm going to get that extra excitation. And so even if we might have initially fairly different patterns of connections coming from the LGN inputs, these visual inputs, um, over time, because of these kind of neighborhood connections, we're going to start to learn more and again Hebbian learning is driven by activity so if we get activated based on those lateral connections then uh, we'll start learning about those things that we got activated for and that force is really what drives the development of these receptive fields in the brain and so you know we can click on these neurons and we can start to see something happening but it's clear if we actually click on this overall display here, which is being updated as the network learns. Here we're plotting the on-center weights as red, where it's greater, stronger in the on-center versus the off-center. And blue shows the off-center, where the off-center's weights are stronger than the on-center. And as you start to stare at this as it learns, you can just start to see this pattern of oriented edge detectors start to fill in and emerge kind of very slowly and subtly that the main statistical structure is these oriented edges and furthermore because of that connectivity within the layer it's forming this kind of topographic map uh, neighboring neurons are uh, encoding similar orientations and in fact we do see these kind of pinwheel structures where these orientations organize around a central degenerate point in the middle, uh, which often has very weak kind of orientation tuning. One thing I forgot to mention is that uh, the neighborhood relationships in, in the network are uh, something that, that, that wraps around. So if you're on one side, uh, you wrap around to the other neighboring side and similarly from top to bottom. So this is actually topographically a torus. Uh, the edge effects are kind of hard to deal with. We can load the weights after the network has completely learned and do a plot of what those receptive fields look like. Uh, and it's very similar to what we just saw. I think it did actually finish learning. If we reduce the strength of those lateral connections, um, we can see that effect. You can do it here by changing these and retraining the network. So now the lateral connections are much weaker um, what we see is that the topography is correspondingly not uh, organized. And, and each neuron essentially just learns some random uh, orientation coding on its own without coordinating with its neighbors. So in summary, we can see through this model that the network using basic Hebbian learning principles is able to develop these characteristic patterns of oriented edge detectors organized in a clear topographic organization
uh, just like you see in the brain. And so this is a good fit for the available evidence here that we see about these pinwheel structures. And again, this all emerges through these kind of self-organizing learning mechanisms. And models like this were developed in the early 90s and really established the idea that the organization of V1 could be understood in terms of these basic Hebbian learning principles. Okay, and next we're going to build on this and look at how object recognition builds up on top of these uh, lower level oriented edge detectors so that we can recognize full objects.